Yeah, and thank you all for coming uh, coming to my talk. I'm pretty excited to see so many people. Like usually in Denmark, when I talk about this topic, it's like 20 people attending. So this is very nice. So I've chosen to call my my talk "Security Champions and Experiments: Building Blocks for Security Culture Change." Um, I have no use no AI making this presentation. Uh, I found this need like project called Responsibility uh, Responsible AI Disclosure. I, I can recommend it. They have a bunch of like icons, but if you showed up for this talk to hear me talk about how we are going to use tools, hacking, and AI to solve our, all our application security problems, I'm sorry to say you had the wrong talk. This is not what I'm going to be talking about. Instead, I'd really like to try to stress like the issue that we, like as a community, really should start focusing a little bit more on like how to build foundations of application security programs. Um, and I think to me that really comes from from looking at like you know this thing that that people often call like the three pillars of of application security, where you got like technology and tools, processes, and people and organization. They're usually called pillars. I've flipped them over on the side because I think it's more like layers. I think it's really important that you have people and organization figured out before you start looking at processes, and then in the end you can build technology and tools on top of that. I think if you start from the top, you're most likely going to fail. So that's the argument I'm going to try to be making today. So I'm going to be concentrating on the lower half of, of this, this layered model here. So now I've talked about you know, what, what you're not going to hear about, but what you are going to hear about is you know, what kind of problem can we solve using security champions. I'm going to dig a little bit into the academic research on the topic and my experience in the area. Then I want to talk about how, in my organization, we've been doing security champions. And I'm going to end up talking a little bit about how security champions are starting to change our, our security culture in our organization. And this is not just like to put myself on a slide, uh, maybe a little bit, but you know, I, I think it's important to understand where I'm coming from, to understand why we've taken the approach that we have. So I've been in Bank Data, the organization that I work for, for the last two years, and I'm the application security and security champions lead. It's a technical role. I'm not a manager. I have a PhD in computer science, so I've done research, and but I've also worked as a software developer. And I think when it comes to application security, having that developer mindset in the back of your head is really important if you want to succeed. I've worked in research and consulting within security and privacy for the last 15 years. When I did research, it was in the topic of usable security and privacy. And just to give you an idea of what that means, that is basically like how do we make security and privacy work for, for the people that we're designing it for, be that like employees or developers or like, you know, just citizens. When I got hired in my, my current role, I really narrowed that field a lot down, you know, from, from looking at this very broad perspective on cybersecurity and, and privacy, I'm now solely focusing on application security. So I think that's been an interesting journey. Now, now I got to like dig really deep, and I really appreciated that. But just to sum it up, I would call myself an experimental computer scientist with a qualitative background. And you're probably going to see why in, uh, in the approach that we've taken. Uh, can you save the questions for afterwards, or else I'm afraid I'm not going to get through my slides, but uh, in the end, very much. Just one slide on uh, where I'm from. Uh, we're called the Association of Bank Data. In Denmark, we got a lot of small banks. They can't afford to do their own IT development, so they've gone together, formed an association. It's these eight banks that are listed up here. So we're not a bank ourselves, but we are a financial institution that provides IT for these banks. So we work in a super highly regulated industry. We're being hit by a lot of regulation right now because our member banks have different sizes, so they're hit by different legislation. So in this two, DORA, very much on our agenda for, at the moment. I was at the, the SAM user day yesterday. I realized a 1,000 employees is not necessarily in global context considered big. I can tell you in Denmark, we are one of the biggest software development organizations. We got around 600 developers distributed on 80 teams. We got teams doing other stuff as well. And so we run a digital bank with around 1 million daily interactions, just to give you an idea of like, so if we, if we are not working for a full day, that, that's not great. 
So why should we have security chairmans? Well, having a research background and having worked in this area for a while, I've come to realize that application security seems to have a people problem. I've, I've heard like other conference talks talk about the people problem, but I would say, you know, I'm kind of flipping it around because often it's talked about as the people being the problem. That is not really the case. It's actually application security that has a problem dealing with like actual humans. I read this research paper is from Usenix security last year. I think it's, it's a brilliant paper, but I really like, I was really intrigued by the end of their abstract, which said, this is a quote, industry best practices and state of the art in human centered security research are not aligned. So this is from last year. Are any of you familiar with this paper called Users are Not the Enemy? No? Well, a couple. But I can tell you it's like a similar paper in, in like usable security research, which basically looked into like password policies, you know, what did the security, um, you know, parts of the company expect and how did people actually act that out in companies? It turned out they were not very well aligned. I would, I would say that this is probably still a problem in quite a lot of places. And it's a very, very small print here, but I'm just going to point out that this paper was written in 1999. Some of you might not even have been born back then. And I think it's a little bit of a shame that, that something which was pointed out 25 years ago is still not industry like standard. This, um, paper spawned a lot of more specific research into like, you know, different types of users. And I'm, I'm focusing a little bit here on like, developers and security managers. Another paper had the conclusion, you know, if you don't include developers in developing your security processes, you tend to get like these super rigid processes and you get developers that are creative. And I put that in quotation marks. This is not the good kind of creative. This is developers trying to say, okay, this the security team, they say, when you do this, this is totally ruining how we work. So we're going to try to work around it. We don't want that. There's a lot of other papers here, like I'm going to share the slides afterwards, but you, if you are interested in reading it, the references are down here. But I think the main conclusion is really that too much security is designed without developer UX in mind. That goes for like, you know, security products where the APIs are like cumbersome to use and very difficult to use. It also includes, you know, like research on, you know, this expectation that everybody has to be a security expert and there's evidence in research that this doesn't scale either. And again, the last one is mainly the, the headline here is that we really need to start including developers more in, uh, in the design processes of, of um, our security solutions. So how does this uh, all relate to like, you know, the problems that, that, that we had in, in, uh, in bank data? So how did we use to approach security? In general, like our development organization had been on this decentralization journey, you know, now we need autonomous teams, like DevOps is like the new thing. So every developer team all of a sudden had the responsibility to implement a reasonable level of security. We had some central teams that would provide, you know, authentication, authorization, you know, security solutions. But they were provided to the teams as like, you know, here's a product, please read the documentation and figure out how to use it. So there was like some sort of rather abstract set of guidelines that you had to find on Confluence. Maybe not the best idea. So I would really ask the question whether or not we, we really took the, the UX of developers into consideration um, in our previous setup. Just to give you an idea of how that, that, that might look. Up in the, the top uh, right corner there, well, left from your side, uh, we have, like, here's just four developer teams. And, like, these other boxes, that is just examples of our centralized teams providing uh, something like platform or a security tool. Again, mainframe, we're, we're doing bank software, so we've got a lot of old code. So whenever a dev team, which might, you know, and they still do span most of our technology stack, would, would need to figure out how do we make reasonable, like, decisions on application security. They basically needed to go out and get information from all these different teams. This is one team. And I've only listed four teams here. Remember, we're 80 developer teams. So just the amount of errors going back and forth here is maybe not ideal. It's probably a lot of redundant information being communicated. 
And again, there's really nobody capturing the questions being asked in a central place. What I found when I started was that the teams were actually doing pretty good. I think it comes down to the fact that we're a highly regulated industry. They, they know that we're taking care of people's money. So, you know, they were actually doing quite well. The problem was that every time they spent time on these like security need, like sitting down, figuring out where to go to find the documentation, this is time that could have been spent like developing business logic. And let's, let's face it, you know, we're a business. We need to make money. We need to keep our customers happy. The less time we can spend on security in the individual teams, the better for the business. So we really like to minimize the time spent on security. So I would say the developer UX was taken into consideration to a small degree. Huge technology stacks, a huge like burden on the developers, and we didn't really talk too much to actual developers. So according to the research I just presented, maybe we got some creative people. So yeah, we, we, we tried to figure out what to do about that in looking for what I call like finding the missing link. What we found in our analysis as, was that the, the security organization was basically way too far uh, away from, from the development organization. It tended to be a little bit top down and compliance based. You know, we're doing this because of this too. You know, here's a tool. Please use it. Security was done okay, but again, it wasn't super consistent because we weren't capturing um, too much information on it. And whenever we rolled out something new, there was really no feedback loop in, in, for us to like figure out how does this actually hit the development organization, you know, and, and we really don't want to create resistance towards the whole application security project. And if we don't talk to the, like the developers, that, that's where we might end up. We found out that security champions was probably a way to solve this. So how did we implement this uh, in our organization? Well, I think exactly what's in the role of a security chairman is probably like important to define. So this is how, how we define it. We see this as a, as a, as a two way role. For one, like a security chairman is the application security team. That's where I'm sitting. It's representative towards the development organization. But just as important, they're also representing the development organization in the application security team. We want them to be the first line assistance in everything uh, related to, to uh, application security. So that means that, you know, instead of contacting me and the team I'm in directly, we really want them to contact the security chairmen. Sometimes they're not going to be able to answer the question, but at least, you know, then we can propagate the question to wherever it needs to go. We also focused on trying to make a very clear division between what is and what is not expected from these security champions. Being in like an, a conference here that has everything from like breaker to builder to defender and manager. I think it's also important to stress that I, I see this more as, you know, we don't want them to think like hackers. We really want them to think like engineers, start having this mindset of, you know, building quality software includes building secure software. We don't need somebody who's like a, Again, they can be if they want to, but like somebody who's really, really good at a capture the flag exercise if they don't know how to change the code to prevent that attack. We looked into like the literature that was out there uh, in terms of like how do we build these programs. We were very inspired by Tanya Yanka and the whole We Hack Purple community. This is her recipe for, um, for building security champions like recruit, engage, teach, recognize, reward, don't stop. I'm not going to go through these. You can like this presentations online where she goes through these and I think that they're really good. But we also looked a little bit at, you know, like this is a, again, an academic reference, but um, this is a, a, a survey on, you know, like the literature out there and research, you know, what, what's in security chairman programs. Based on this and our experience starting out um, trying to build something, uh, something new, was that this re didn't really quite cut it for us. We really needed like a recipe that captures a lot more of the context around, you know, training security chairmen and engaging with them. So this is our six step uh, recipe. You need buy-in from management. We need volunteers. We need to design a communication flow. 
We need to have an experimental mindset. We need to engage with these people on a regular basis. And again, program visibility is important. I saw on the program, there's a really good talk on uh, buy-in for management. I inherited a program where, you know, all the security chairmen are allowed to spend 20% of their time. And that is buy-in for management there. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. Moving on to how we recruited these champions. If you see this as like some hypothetical representation of our organization, each of these silos is a different business area, and uh, each of the, the squares is, is a team. Well, then this is how we ended up recruiting our champions. I think important things here is to know we don't have a champion in every team. Again, I'll get back to our meetings, but we want to have meetings in a regular meeting room with a lot of interaction. So we, we've set like a maximum of around 30 people. We also want each uh, business area to have at least uh, two security chairmen. So if somebody gets a brick in the head, we haven't lost all the knowledge. And if we look a little bit more at like one of the silos here, we also need these uh, security chairmen to represent the teams that they're not in themselves. So, so it's been very important for us to get like buy-in from the, the business area managers. But we also want to create some re redundancy in terms of how these teams are represented. Again, the brick in the head. We're not quite there yet, but ideally we would like at least two security champions to have some sort of interaction with each team. Then we really focused a lot on trying to design like a good communication flow. Because I'll bring you back to this figure that I showed before. This is not good. So we, we tried to create like a pipeline instead where we have the development organization on the left and uh, our centralized teams who have some sort of security um, properties on the right. I sit in the application security team. We are like the one who take the communication from these centralized teams. And then we use security champions to communicate with the teams. And again, the teams communicate with their security chairmen and send that to us so we can propagate it. And again, this enables us to actually capture this information that wasn't being captured in a centralized place before. And I think that has really helped us to prioritize where we're going to spend the time. I've also added a box here called the security chairman's core. That is a team of stakeholders uh, from the, from the whole organization, mainly people from uh, from the right here. We got information security involved. We got all the different platforms, mainframe, private cloud, public cloud, front end. We also uh, have like, you know, we're providing like CI, CD pipelines from a centralized place. We also really need to, to speak to them a lot. So we actually engage with them on a regular basis, just catch up what's happening right now. Again, I would like to point out, we really try to keep managers out of this. We really want it to be the technical people, the people who actually sit and work with these things. So, so these are like leads from, from these teams. I also really think you, we need to have this very experimental mindset if we're going to succeed. So what does that mean? Well, we need to think about like new initiatives in terms of like being experiments. We, we need to be able to start over when something doesn't work. We want to be able to do like gradual rollout of new initiatives. And I think I have an empirical methods background. I think we really need to focus more on evaluation. It, it seems like a trivial thing, but I have seen in, in my work life, you know, that somebody says, oh, we're going to make an experiment. We're just going to take this tool, try this out with no real plan for concluding whether or not this tool works or not. And all of a sudden, it's used in some parts of the organization, not in others. And nobody really knows whether or not they're supposed to use it or not. We want to avoid that. So why do we want this very structured approach? This isn't Danish. It doesn't really matter what it says. But, but this is actually like a word template that we fill out when we want to do an experiment. Some people might say, oh, this is a lot of like work up front. Why are you doing this? You know, couldn't you just, you know, start rolling stuff out? But I would say, you know, for one, maybe when you sit and do like a proper analysis of what you're trying to do, you might actually discard an experiment before you start rolling something out. We also really want to capture, you know, what do we do if something fails? If we roll out a tool and we say, oh, okay, we're not going to go with this vendor, we need to roll this back. If we haven't planned for this, this is going to be extremely difficult. 
I also found that if we just listen to the people who are loud, we listen to the 10% and not the silent majority of the 90%. In my experience, the 10% are also the people who are actually doing quite well as it is. They just want to do even better. But if we really want to take a risk-based approach, we really need to concentrate a little bit more on these 90%. Of course, we can't you know, forget the other ones, but if we don't talk to the people who aren't saying anything, we're missing a lot of information. When we want to focus on evaluation, it's actually really important that we think about like what do we, what kind of data do we need to be able to evaluate once we're done with an experiment? If we haven't thought about that at all, then we're done and we're saying, okay, now we need to figure out whether this worked. It's going to be impossible. At least to say something, you know, reasonable about, I, I would, I would argue. And again, the last bullet here, I just put that we've spent a lot of, of time doing stuff with security champions that is very hard to like capture in a quantitative way. So if you capture, you know, think a little bit more about the qualitative aspects of how you're going to do interviews, like with developers, we can actually start using that data to say something towards management. So if you were want to try this out, I would say you need to focus on the why, what, how, who, and evaluation. And of course, you need some sort of time plan. To give you an idea of how that might look, this is not how, how we've done it, but I'm just to give you a hypothetical experiment. Let's say we have a SAS tool we want to figure out. Well, we have a problem. We have a lot of raw SAS results, and we don't want to create a lot of resistance by rolling a lot of false positives out in like 80 teams. So we really want the security champions to do the triaging of the results, so only relevant stuff is, is handed down to the teams. So this is tool agnostic, so using a tool, we want to test how the security champions try out the results and what the user experience of using that tool is for the security champions. So it's twofold. And I think the who, the stakeholder analysis, is really important. I think, you know, I've realized often, okay, we actually should talk to these people, like get their input. We should inform these people that we're doing this. So sitting down and thinking structured about who's actually affected by what we're doing is also important. For this experiment, I would say, of course, the security champions, the AppSec team where we're sitting, the development teams that we're involving in the experiment, product owners. I, I should have made that bold because product owners are the ones who actually prioritize the stuff you know, like the, the backlog items in the actual sprint. So I think that is very important. And again, the managers and the platform team who control the CI CD pipelines. So how can you evaluate an experiment like this? I would say semi structured interviews with participating security champions at the end of the experiment. This is a way of capturing, you know, not just talking to people, but actually being able to capture the information and reason about it. And of course, we also want to see, like, are they actually doing a good job? I could talk a lot more about experience. I just want to give you an idea of how we're trying to use it. We're not quite, we're not doing this with everything yet, but we're really trying to move in this direction. We also want to engage with our security champions. So we're building and maintaining this community by, you know, we have regular meetings. It's mandatory attendance. We have some online channels that captures, you know, if the security chairman asks a question, we really want them to ask it in the Teams channel, not with us, because then if another person has the same question, they can say it's already been answered. And sometimes they can also help each other answer the questions. So, so that's really taking some load off of us. We do yearly training, and that's a truth with modifications because, um, we, we do, like, at our regular meetings, sometimes if there's something we really need to train them on, of course, we also do that. So how do we actually do these meetings? Well, it's a full-day meeting. It's a once-a-month thing. It's a combination of presentations from, from example, me. This is, you know, I could give a talk on this is how we want to do authorization or this is cross-site scripting. We also workshop a lot with them to try to figure out how to do certain things. And then there's the training part. Recently, uh, a couple of meetings ago, we, we took this approach of trying to see, well, we have this, we have this uh, team who do the authorization solution. They've done a great product. 
but we really wanted to be a little bit curious about like how are the teams actually using it. We could capture some information from a central hole, uh, central place, but we really wanted to to like we actually asked the security chairmans to go out and talk to all the teams that they're connected to, and ask them, you know, are you using uh, the authorization solution in the way that's prescribed, and why not? Because some of them weren't, and and. That was, again, we really wanted to capture that information so we can feed that back and have a discussion with the authorization team on how to improve the processes and tools. When you're a security chairman, you also get a lot of input from the organization. You get some, you know, to look into the machine room a little bit. Uh, so we invite, like, people from the platform team and the CISO and, like, the CTO to come give talks. This might be controversial to some of you. Um, we're a Danish-based company. All three locations are within 100 kilometers. So we really have a, a you know this physical meeting. We don't record anything. And unless they have to do an exercise on a computer, we ask people to put away their computers and their phones. And I could see, you know, like, there's not that many, like, you know, computers up here. Well, I like that. But... We really found that that has, especially for the more introvert people, really enabled them to engage a lot more. They're not hiding behind their computers anymore. They're actually participating. So it's been a really big success for us. And if we forget to tell people to put away their computers, like they will bring it up themselves. So I think that's really nice. I know it might not work for all of you. I would recommend it, especially when you want to workshop stuff. This might also be controversial to some of you, but I really like this bottom-up approach where we really say, well, and this was like a discussion with one of my colleagues recently where we really started thinking a little bit about what are we actually doing. And in the end, our approach to application security is really like negotiated and revised during these meetings. If you're a security chairman and you have something on, yeah, like on your mind and you think we could do stuff better, we're listening and we're taking that back and we're like, We'll involve the security chairman in trying to figure out what to do instead. So, it's also important to have some visibility. I am wearing a security chairman's hoodie. My colleague down there is as well, so we can both answer questions after this talk if, if you're interested. So we handed these out to create some visibility, and, and we're doing like an information campaign with like posters and stuff in our locations uh, during this fall. So. How are we actually changing security cultures with, with, with the stuff that we're doing? I can tell you we're not there yet, but we are starting to see a change. The security chairmans are reaching out to our, us in the application security team a lot more than they used to. Before, the teams would reach out to me. So, so that's a really big change, and that's something that, that we're really... You know, again, then we can start focusing on, on, on other stuff, so I think that's great. We focused a lot on uh, building a solid foundation. So like, again, the three layers of application security. We have now built a foundation. We're going to start deploying a lot more tools and, and having like more solid processes around that now. We also succeeded in creating this uh, stable and highly engaged group of security chairmen for anonymization reasons. I've cut their heads off here. But I think where we've really seen the biggest change is that we are now discovering security issues that people didn't know, you know, where to go with this problem before. If you're in a team and you, you, you don't know if the, what you're doing is correct and you ask somebody and they send you to another place and they send you to another place, at some point you're going to give up. I don't know if any of you are like American, but like I had to change my subscription with Comcast once and I, that took me like hours and I was being sent around in a circle and that was super frustrating. And I think some of our developers had the same experience here. So I think overall we see top management as well talking about application security in a way they didn't do a couple of years ago. And, you know, I can hear when I go out, I sit, you know, I'm at, at the coffee machine or doing like a social event and people will come talk to us and they will engage with us. So I think. We've been quite successful in this. So, to sum up, we need to start addressing the people problem in application security. And again, this is not the people. We're going to have to look at how we do application security. 
We need to find a way of communicating what's being done in the research community to a broader audience. We re this discrepancy is really not great. We also see that, that security champions, again, with 600 developers, we would need a really big application security team. So if you want to have a successful program, I would say you really need to have a lot of security. Well, you need to have a security champions program. I think an experimental mindset is key if you want to succeed in what you're doing. And it's helping us, you know, in bank data change our application security culture the way that we're doing it. So I'm going to leave you with like two messages. And one is we're going to fail. We can't think of anything of, of everything. So let's make sure that we fail small so we don't create resistance in the organization. And as a community, let's start focusing a little bit more on the human aspects of building good application security programs. That was my message. Questions? Okay. Please do. So how did you push to get two champions per per her business area, yeah. Actually, the yeah, and and actually, it it kind of just happened for us. But we now like whenever like a security team and you know stops, we we go out and talk to the business area manager and the managers out there and the security team is there to try to figure out you know are there any other people interested that we can get on board. So we haven't had any st structured process around it. Yeah. Sure. Um, <laughs> thanks for a very interesting talk. It was eye-opening. Uh, I see security teams trying to uh, hit developers directly with their messages. So they want to send emails to the whole organization. Mm -hmm. Whereas you are channeling the communication through two, hop, two hops, and the security champions are meant to spread within their teams. Mm -hmm. What happens with bad security champions that don't share the information? That means it will never even hit the developers. And how do you, I mean, obviously that's a problem, but yeah. if you tell the security team, trust us, the information is hitting the developers? I think that's a really good question. I don't think I've really thought much about it. Um, but we do, you know, try to like engage with security teams and talk to them during these meetings to figure out whether or not they're actually, you know, talking to the teams. A lot of the security teams have actually like, requested that we give them a little bit of a bigger toolbox so they actually make it out to the teams. But it's definitely something we want to be collecting a little bit more data on than, than we are now. But it's a really good question. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think that's again something we're also trying to focus a little bit more on. And I think, you know, I was at the Sam user day yesterday and I think something like, you know, Sam, I, I like it because, well, there's a lot of discussion about like, for those of you who aren't familiar, you know, Sam gives you like a score. And I think to me, having a score that I can show that, that this is actually making a difference is something that, that I think is important in the long term. Like we still have a lot of backing to do this, but I think management is asking for us to, to deliver more, like you know, metrics on on, on how we're doing. So it was no upfront agreement that this is what we want to see out of the program. So you, you basically inherited the program. Yeah. Well, I inherited like the idea of the program, and then I implemented it. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Like, come find me. I, I'm wearing the red hat for like that reason today. If you want to find me, you, you, you should be easy. I don't know who was. <laughs> yeah, a lot of. Uh, really, in the back, maybe. There. Yeah. Well, I think uh, right now we're trying to, to get funding for one of the, the training platforms, which I think would be like nice. But so far, I, I really have the, the experience that, that just the fact that they're actually being heard and they're being included in designing the processes is enough for people to show up because we have a really stable group. 
people leave if they get promoted, you know, to like a managerial p- position or like changed on a company. But we, we really haven't had any issues. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a question I get a lot. And I, I, I can't tell you anything else than, you know, people seem to like what we're doing. We run it for like uh, one and a half years. Mm-hmm. And I think something like OWASP SAM it, it would, would be a, a, a really great tool for us. You know, if we start filling that out on a regular basis, then if we can actually see that like we're starting to score higher on, on, on different parameters, I think, I think that uh, that's a good way of doing it. So many questions. Yes. <laughs> so besides now, yes. Uh, no, we don't like. We're not that many people. We 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 put some out to some of the platform teams, like running the CI/CD pipelines, making sure that works. We, we're actually we, we're running our own like security pipeline, which is our responsibility in the team. But we use security champions to like go through the information that that these provide, and then you know talk to the teams about it. In in essence, in terms of responsibility, and I think that's also something we've been working a little bit on lately. Is we really as it is right now, a security team has the responsibility of informing and like collecting information and advising, but it's still the team that has the responsibility of actually like implementing security. But we have centralized uh, a lot of that, so we are taking some of that on, on our team. Just yeah. a moment. So, okay. okay. Yeah. Again, we, we, we're trying to aim to have around 30 security champions because if we want to do the meetings the way we do them today, we, we have a maximum limit. So, and we have 600 developers, so it's like 30 to like 600 as it is right now. We we are uh, we we do have a, a like a, a document that we keep up to date. Again, we negotiate it on uh, on an ongoing basis, but we do have it because I think that was really important. We didn't in the beginning, but we found that that really created a lot of uncertainty amongst the security chairmen what they were actually supposed to do. So I think it is really important to have it written down. Also, when you want to onboard a new security chairman, you need to be able to go to the manager and say this is what this person is expected to do. Uh, as it is right now, it's not the security champions. It is more like also security team together with like, you know, the, the responsibility lies in, in the centralized teams in the end. But of course, you know, with our input and in the end, we, their, their, you know, responsibility is to implement what we tell them to implement in the security organization. Yes. But, but, you know, but like with our platforms, we're also like, we're the application security team and with the platforms, it, it's also involves a lot of our like, you know, more operational teams, uh, security teams. Okay. Well, 
uh, one in the back. Can, can you stand up? Yes, it's easier. Yes. <laughs> Well, that, that is again then the responsibility of the security champions that they have regular interactions with, with the teams in the development organization. Mm -hmm. But it, again, th that is one of the one of the motivations for having security chairmans is that when we didn't have that, then nobody was really listening to like. Well, I don't know if you can listen to somebody who's silent, but nobody was really interacting with them. So I think you know that is like why we've you know created that that extra you know layer of, of security chairmans to be able to. To go out and, you know, give them tasks and say, before the next meeting, could you please go out and talk to all the teams in your organization about this specific issue? So that's how we're trying to do it. Yeah. Okay. Yes, stand up. <laughs> you mentioned the clear division between what is expected and what is not expected from your security mm -hmm. What is not expected from them? Well, for one, we don't expect them to be responsible for the teams actually implementing what they tell them to implement. So that, that is the manager in the team in the end that, that's responsible for that. And I think, you know, as, as we, we're putting more and more on them, you know, as we're rolling out new tools in the beginning, we're running experiments. It's not their responsibility, but, but again, we, we update this list uh, all the time. So I think mainly the thing is that they're not responsible for, for the security in the teams. Yes, stand up. We don't. Uh, we have a lot of external developers, but they can't be security champions. No, no. Uh, we haven't had the the requests from any of our external uh, developers, but I think you know that because again, we we do. We do this recruiting through the managers in, in the team, so so they, they know that. And I think, you know, like spending 20% of the time doing this just to learn a lot of stuff, I, I don't think we want to pay external developers to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, I like then. Then we take it back, and then in the AppSec team, we do a roadmap, and and we then we take it to management to get to get buy-in. Yeah. Okay. Here. Thank you so much for that. That was a wonderful presentation. I'm just wondering. You mentioned that you do all day workshops once a month with your developers. Mm -hmm. What does the training aspect of that look like? Are you training them on specific vulnerabilities? Maybe the top ten or the it's a combination. It's really, you know, what, what, what makes sense at, at, at the time, giving the feedback that we've gotten. But we, as I said, we do like one full day a year where we, we do a lot of repetition of like, you know, basic aspects of, of application security, you know, like OWASP top 10, we, we go through like something like ASVS, you know, how we see that fitting in our organization. But we really try, I think that wasn't in my presentation, but I think a thing that we're really trying to say distinguishes like an expert from a semi-expert is that we really want the security chairmans to be experts in security, like application security within our organizations, you know, like, so when you're deploying to our like Kubernetes platform, you know, all the, the guardrails they need to know about that, so they need to know what to concentrate on, where I would say like a super expert needs to know like a lot more like general stuff. So we really try to contextualize everything, well, most of the things that, that we communicate to security chairmans. Okay, we'll take two more questions. One there. Okay, <laughs> you, yes. Please stand up. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was great. Uh, small presentation, just a question. How much do you have been involved in the past in the security 
difference in the attention level. Sorry, can you can you? Yeah. I think we've, uh, we've, again, we've taken a very bottom up approach, but I think we're getting to the point now where we're doing a lot more management than we did in the beginning. So I think, I think, um, we've realized that especially like as they started communicating more and more with us that we needed more management. So yeah, I, th I think we're, we're successful. We're still not, again, I don't know if we'll ever get to like, you know, like the gold standard, but we are, as I said, constantly renegotiating this, but I think we have switched more towards trying to manage this uh, than we did in the beginning. Okay, last question there. Yeah. Well. Oh, I, I think it could totally work. I, again, I think it's, it's the, the ratio of like external to internal in our organization. I think it makes a lot of sense that we, we don't like include the external developers in it. But if you're like all external, I don't see why that wouldn't work. I, I could totally see that working. But again, I think one, one of the just last comment on that. I think one, one of the key challenges there is that, you know, are you building a lot of knowledge on, on external developers that are only going to be there for a year? Is it really worth it? So I think. The return on investment there is, is important to consider. Thank you. Okay. Maybe. And again, yeah. I can imagine there's there's different uh, <laughs> challenges. <laughs> so again, I, I'm here today and tomorrow, and at ThreadModCon on on Saturday. Please feel free to reach out to me and or my colleague to to talk more about this. I'm I'm very interested to hear your. If you're provoked by what I've said, you know, and, and if you have different viewpoints, I'd very much like to discuss it. Thanks. Thank you.